Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O-Culture Podcast, where we are redesigning the mind of the masses one transmission at a time. I'm Ryan Peverly, your one MC and one DJ for this track. Welcome to the show, thanks for being here. Hopefully by now you have heard episode 106 with Peter Bievergall. If you haven't, I'd cue that one up in addition to what you are listening to right now. Because this episode is that ghostly residue that's been left behind, the ectoplasm that's been left behind after you've been sufficiently haunted. And the reason is, our guest this time around is Dr. Kristen Gallerno, and her recent book, High Static Dead Lines, is eerily similar to Peter's Strange Frequencies, which we talked about last month. Kristen is an artist, curator, and sonic researcher with a PhD in art practice and media history an M.A. in Folklore, and an M.F.A. in Art. She's also the Curator of Communication and Information Technology at the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit, Michigan, where she continues to build upon one of the largest historical technology collections in North America. And that recent book, High Static Deadlines, forms the basis for our conversation here. This book has been described as a literary mixtape that explores the entwined boundaries between sound, material culture, landscape, and esoteric belief. The book contains essays and fictocritical interludes that are arranged to evoke a network of ley lines for the sonic specter to travel through. What's a sonic specter? Glad you asked. It's a hypothetical presence that manifests itself as an invisible layer of noise alongside the conventional histories of technological artifacts. And the connective thread, both in the book and in that episode with Peter Biebergall, is the recurring presence of sound charting the contentious sonic histories of paranormal culture. Now, I said Peter's book Strange Frequencies was the coolest book I'd read this year, but I think I have to eat those words because High Static Deadlines was a hell of a lot of fun to dig into as well. But of course, as always, you will be the judge of that. Dr. Kristen Gallerno is in the house right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. Kristen Gallerno. It's very nice to have you here. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem. So, you know, up front here, I wanted to talk about your upbringing, because I know that you grew up in a family that was very much into esoteric and or occult ideas. What was that family dynamic like for you exactly? And how has it shaped the professional and artistic path that you've been pursuing? Yeah, it's funny when we start to think of things of like terms like occult and paranormal and supernatural. And you had a very fascinating guest on your show a couple of weeks ago named Peter Biebergall. I think I'm saying his name right. And it was interesting to hear his breakdown of like differences of ideas to these sorts of terms and, and the kinds of ideas we attach to them. And I think sometimes the occult sounds like this like scary thing, right? <laughs> so especially yeah. it's kind of like a loaded term thanks to, you know, satanic panic in the 1980s and things like this, especially. 
So my family, I think it would be more, it's, it's very much a sort of like lived experience. And so in the process of writing the book, I've been very nervous about um, sort of including my own family background in even a semi-autobiographical sort of sense. But I felt like I needed to, to have that happen for the book to be true to what I wanted it to be. So the book itself, High Static Deadlines, is kind of like about the physical and psychological spaces that are associated with the history of technology. And they're all, every single chapter, whether it's a literary vignette or a sort of hard and fast academic essay about the histories of these strange technologies, they're all in some way aligned with supernatural stories or the potential for that sort of mapping of belief onto physical artifacts or interpretations. And through it all, there's this sort of idea of thickened media and um, especially the idea of sound, which is overarching everything, binding it all together. Not very good at elevator speeches, but that's the <laughs> sort of general sense of the book. And then so there are these academic essays and then there are also these literary vignettes that I mentioned. And those are very much aligned with what you're talking about with this idea that hints at my family background. And I grew up in rural Ontario uh, in case my accent didn't give me away already, um, as it does sometimes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so I grew up in this family where um, the supernatural very much sort of defined day to day life. In public, I went to Catholic school. We didn't really go to church very much or anything like that. So there was this very sort of public private division of belief. But in the background, there was also this very syncretic approach to the structures of religion and supernatural belief, which kind of reigned it over it all. And on my mom's side, there was this really long lineage. My mom, my grandmother, great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother, and as far back as I can trace, of some sort of ability for divinatory practice. So at various points in my life, my mom was either um, toying with seances in the house, as was my grandmother, uh, Ouija boards. My mom read some sort of used uh, normal decks of cards as these divinatory tools. My grandmother read tea leaves, as did my great grandmother. And it kind of goes back and back and back. And then there are all these sort of funny hints at stories that you hear about as a kid, like these, you know, family gatherings where people would talk to the table. And I only sort of vaguely understood what all of that was growing up, but I had a decent sense of it because of things I witnessed and overheard and saw and experienced. And then I sort of eventually took that interest in the supernatural as a sort of insider perspective into uh, academia and into my own art practice as well. So I think that's a really rambling <laughs> uh, sort of <laughs> an half answer to your question, probably. That's okay. Yeah, I was just really curious. You know, I had heard you talk about that somewhere else. And I thought, you know, that's an interesting angle into this. Because I didn't grow up in that environment. It's always so weird to me, like, not weird, like bad, but just like, it's it's a very, yeah. it's a very mm -hmm. odd thing to hear that there are kids that have grew up in these environments where, you know, grandma's <laughs> reading tea leaves. And I'm like, what the fuck? Where was I yeah. at? Like, why wasn't my grandma reading tea leaves? We played a lot of right. poker, though, with playing cards. But not, yeah, um, well, and I, I had this sort of off opposite experience where I was like, what the fuck? This isn't normal. <laughs> like, it took <laughs> right. until, like, I left home. I, I always say I sort of escaped my small town. And it wasn't until I, I left and got out on my own that I started to realize, like, wait, this isn't like a normal everyday experience that kids grew up with. No, I mean, it definitely doesn't seem that way. And I grew up in the Midwest where you live now, too. I don't know. I hate calling Michigan and Ohio area the Midwest. It doesn't seem like the Midwest <laughs> to me. It seems more like the Mideast, but, you know, semantics or whatever. But yeah, you did mention in your book, High Aesthetic Deadlines, and we'll dig into some of the ideas in there for sure. But before we do, your day job is fascinating as well. And I think it, it actually, the book may be informed by some of the things that you've encountered at your day job. Tell people a little bit about what you do, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's sort of like the silent partner in the book, actually, <laughs> is the fact that I work at a museum called the Henry Ford Museum as a, a curator, and I'm the curator of communications and information technology. And so I have a rather large collection under my care. I take care of everything from broadcast technology to printing presses, graphic communication, the history of video games, computers, sound technology, telephones, telegraphs. I'm forgetting about a lot of things. So basically, you know, I don't want to posit the Henry Ford as this sort of wellspring of <laughs> supernatural artifacts, but there definitely have been a lot of artifacts under my care 
even if you look at things like the history of telegraphy and um, you know broadcast media as these sort of potential manifestation sites for supernatural belief. And um, the culture of that has been very fascinating. I don't really talk about that very openly in my day-to-day job as a curator, but definitely, you know, I'm around these artifacts all the time, and I'm also constantly acquiring new artifacts. So there's definitely this sort of like blurred border between my literary practice, artistic practice, and my professional life. And it's it's always an interesting and delicate balance. Like, how do you remain a legitimate curator and a public historian who people will respect and listen to when you're also talking about things like, you know, the the paranormal culture and things like this. It's an, it's an unfortunate byproduct of, you know, the culture that dominant culture that we live in. But it, it, there is a lot of legitimate legitimacy there, as is evidenced by the many amazing scholars of the supernatural you've had on this podcast. Well, at what point did you discover the connection between the paranormal or the supernatural and these objects and how they could be imprinted with the voices of dead people or spirits or however you want to look at it. Did you read this in a book? Did you discover it through your own experiences growing up? I mean, yeah, I think a lot of it was just sort of lived practice. The town where I grew up was the site of a relatively, well, I feel like it should be better known than it is, but there was this poltergeist event there in the 18, I want to say the 1830s. It was quite early in terms of uh, poltergeist events, and it was called the Baldoon Mystery. So I always grew up around this, and there was always the sort of potential for finding material evidence left behind by this case. So as a kid, my uncle, was a he had a metal detector, and he would go out metal detecting. And so I accompanied him on a couple trips, and we actually went out to the former site of the house where this poltergeist event happened. And we dug up a lot of hand-hewn iron nails that would have been used in the house at that time. And nothing else had been on that land. So it's like, well, you know, sort of hopeful connection would be these are nails from the house that was purportedly burned down by supernatural fire in this story. It's a whole interesting ball of wax, the Baldoon mystery in and of itself. So there was always this interest in material culture, like right from day one as being a kid. And the Baldoon mystery was one of those things. And then I sort of have always had a very strong art practice running in the background. So I, you know, as a teenager, I started to see publications coming out of, you know, ghost photography and things like this. And then I took that in academia and started to do a little bit of research. And I had the fortune of getting to visit the American Society for Psychical Research's archives. And uh, at that time, I was working on an art project called the Revenant Archives. I don't really work under the Revenant Archives anymore. It was this sort of like pseudo, but also amazingly accurate um, archive about technological devices that had been used as filters of belief in either psychic research or supernatural practice. So one example would be, I think one of the favorite things that I ever uncovered in uh, the ASPR's archive was, it was an illustration of this woman with a sort of bouffant kind of hairdo from the 19th century And tucked into her hair, she had a uh, telegraphy sounding device. And the way it was sort of like a debunking illustration. And it showed how she had this telegraph hidden in her hair. And she had an assistant who was then sounding um, Morse code onto the top of her head by an invisible wire strung across a room. So right from the get go, I was uncovering like really interesting examples like this. And then The more and more that my academic studies and my art practice took me into the sort of more hard and fast areas of like the history of technology, the more digital things started to sway too. I did a lot of research on a gentleman named Ted Sirios, who I'm I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he was a guy who worked in this uh, process of photography where he apparently could imprint images onto Polaroid film using some sort of psychic process. So I always came at all these. You know, an interest in the the technology to be these sort of creative catalysts almost. And I think others, uh, I know Peter Biebergall also talked about this, but yeah, using those technological devices as filters for creativity and just trying to figure out how to weave that into my own art practice. Yeah, I did not know the story of Ted Sirios before I read your book and I was flabbergasted, really. I mean, just just like, his, <laughs> how the hell is that possible? Like, repeat what you said about him. He thought that he yes. could, or he was doing this. He was projecting images onto Polaroid films? 
through his yeah, mind, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it sounds it sounds amazingly strange. So yeah, so Ted Sirius was a uh, bellhop from Chicago, and he was apparently semi literate and also had uh, substance abuse issues and. He would use this little device called the gizmo, which sort of just looked like a little piece of plastic PVC tubing. And he would hold it up against his forehead and kind of through this sort of physical process of exertion, he would then supposedly project an image onto a Polaroid camera across the room. There's a really great book out there about his history written by the person who was studying him. And nobody could ever really figure out how he was doing it. And obviously there there must have been something something at play there. Um, he even went on television and I think it was uh, James Randi could even figure out what he was up to. So he kind of goes on in history as this um, unchecked person who was never able to be properly debunked before he stopped practicing. Yeah, that's a fascinating anecdote from the book there. And let's take a step back and define what I think is probably the overarching, overriding theme of the book. It's this idea of the sonic specter. We've sort of been talking around it, but let's actually define it, you know, what it is and where the idea comes from. Yeah, so the idea of the sonic specter, it's... I mean, it's it's a relatively simple concept. I mean, I'm I'm not deep into worlds of academia that are all about, you know, sort of masking. I, I mean, there's a place for philosophy. And, and so I've always tried to keep my writing very approachable and for a sort of a public audience as a public historian and a, a folklorist. I'm all about sort of accessibility and writing. So this idea of the sonic specter is just very simply that there are sort of technological devices and specifically sound media that have the potential to be interpreted through this idea of sort of thickened or coagulated media. So if you think of something like a record playing at a wrong speed, or a record skipping, or the sort of adducing of audio from something that isn't, isn't something that you would ever think that you could get audio out of, or something like an artifact in a museum, like this funny wooden stake that I'm sort of obsessed with that is in the shape of sound waves, and the sort of connected hidden histories behind those artifacts. That's kind of the idea of the sonic specter. It's, it's something that is kind of haunting physical media waiting to be listened to and unlocked. You know, there's another term, too, that I thought was interesting that I'd like to define up front here. And it's this idea that David E.H. Jones put forth called, well, it's more like, a, I guess, a subfield of sound studies called archaeoacoustics. And yeah. it sounds a little woo-woo to a lot of people, maybe not in the audience here. We're all very much open to the ideas, obviously. But define what that is and what role that plays in, I guess, the background of the book, too. Yeah, so there's the, the idea of archaeoacoustics, which is, you know, it kind of starts with Jones's idea of unraveling sound waves on ancient pottery. And what, what has the potential for these ancient artifacts and the imprints of sonic media on these ancient artifacts? Is, you know, what can we learn from these things? And then that goes a little bit further. And I, I read this book by a guy named David Feaster, or Patrick Feaster, I'm sorry. And his, uh, his book, Pictures of Sound, has this whole concept of uh, adduced media. And so the idea is that, like, generally, okay, so I'm, I'm a curator who happens to take care of a lot of um, sound-based artifacts from the legacy of Thomas Edison. And we often look to that point in history as being the origins of recorded sound media. But somebody like Patrick Feaster or Jones take the idea that you can take something that is, is visual and you can then go back and adduce audio from that. You can use digital media to sort of unlock the potential of sound in these things that may have things like sound waves imprinted on them. So one example is, and I'm forgetting, of course I'm forgetting the name of the person who did this recording, but it was basically like somebody took a, uh, a sheet of glass and coated it over with carbon from a candle flame and then managed to sort of catch sound waves through the scientific apparatus. And it was never meant to be played back. But what was on that vibrational media was a recording of the song Eau Claire de Lune. And so you have this very, I think it was something like 10 or 20 years before Edison's recording. Don't quote me on these dates. I don't have them in front of me. But uh, you have this very sort of early recorded sound media that was never actually meant to be sound media, but was thinking about sound media. 
and it predates Edison's work by quite a distance. Yeah, and you know, you've mentioned a couple books already that you've read, and I'd like to tell people a little bit too about your research process and the amount of, I guess, influences that were weaved in and out of the book here, because <laughs> You know, as somebody who's into the types of things you're into, the research process is probably the most important thing. You know, it's it's the most intense, I would imagine, trying to gather all these sources and, and ideas into one central spot here. But take us through a little bit of the things or of the books and work that really sort of shaped, I guess, what high static deadlines became. Yeah, I think um, part of it was just finding books that gave me some sort of sense that like, I had permission to write the type of book that, that I did write. This idea of mashing up personal experience with academic research is not always looked upon kindly, I mean, depending on the audience, but there are a few sort of like key books that allowed me... Top search results. Sorry, my Google phone is thinking I want to yeah, ask Yeah, we're things. getting a little Sonic Spectre interference here. <laughs> Very weird. Uh, we could go into the history of uh, Google uh, wraiths on uh, Google Maps, but I don't think we have space for that here. I think we have plenty <laughs> of space for it. We'll, I... we'll get to it later, weird. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, books books that have shaped uh, the sort of beginnings of the high static deadlines research were just the types of books that allowed me the permission to, to sort of proceed with this. And, and so discovering books like the person who wrote the intro to my book, Dave Tompkins, he wrote this book called uh, How to Recognize Beach. And it's about the history of the Vogue Quarter. But it's done in this very sort of literary style, but also incorporating things like deep military and sound history and hip hop history. There's a book called Dream Worlds of Alabama by Alan C. Shelton. There's this idea of like ficto critical writing one of my writing mentors, a woman named Leslie Stern, always said that fictocritical writing was like non-boring academic writing. So it was it allowed you the space to sort of include personal narrative and background. And Dream Worlds of Alabama has this really great segment in it where the author is questioning whether his refrigerator can actually act as a, a time machine. And he's comparing it against passages mm -hmm. from uh, Walter Benjamin, where he's talking about you know, the expired yogurt and pickled herring that have been kind of rotting away in his uh, refrigerator and um, all these family memories into the things that are in his, his fridge. And he has this quote that kind of has always stuck with me from that passage. And he says, what if spaces had their own architectural specters or if objects like fridges could act as a medium to the dead? <laughs> so, you know, some of the things on the shelves in his refrigerator relate to the, the memories of his, you know, passed away aunt in her Christmas cake in the fridge where he couldn't bring himself to throw it out. So things like that, books that are very imbued with the idea of uh, landscapes and the embedded memories in landscape, which are just absolutely paramount to my own experiences that are uh, relayed in the book. And then things like Mark Fisher, and there's this great book called House of Psychotic Women, written by Kirla Janice, uh, which is a exploration of sort of neurotic women in the history of film, but she includes her own passageways through uh, her also Canadian landscape, uh, and the sort of traumas connected to that. And then, you know, stacks of old fate magazines, Omni magazines, My Brother's Inherited horror comics, things like that. All of these things, both lowbrow and highbrow, all had a sort of uh, imprint on the book in various ways. You mentioned a few things in there that I'd like to tease out. I have a stack of Fate magazines sitting right here on my desk, probably 15 or 20 <laughs> of them. So that's that's an interesting coincidence. And then also the fridge comment that you made. So let me just throw a, a brief anecdote of my own here at you. I was in college. I was seeing this girl, and one night we uh, were indulging in some herbal remedies of choice as you will in college right <laughs> and sure, now yeah. too i guess but uh, -huh. uh she thought that the refrigerator was a time machine and tried to crawl in it because <laughs> she w she wanted to go back to you know somewhere but i remember this because i thought wow that's an interesting idea like what if the fridge is a time machine i had no <laughs> knowledge of this work that you just cited but it's interesting that somebody out there before that at some point has thought of this same thing. And now I'm, I don't know, like you get like a deja vu feeling or something like, oh, mm -hmm. I've, that memory was imprinted on me, obviously, because I just related to you. But it's interesting how these ideas just sort of permeate out there. Yeah. Like, yeah. I never thought I'd be talking about haunted food before <laughs> in a public uh, sort of platform before. But, you know, there, 
there is sort of like something nostalgic. Okay, so at the museum, I'm going to tell you about a, a funny artifact that always blows everybody's minds. It's not a haunted artifact, but it is an artifact that's haunted by its own sort of past. So at the museum in our cold storage, we actually have a donut that is well over 100 years old. And wow. um, let that sink in just for a minute. Yeah. So it's a donut in a museum. It's, um, yeah, it's a well over 100 years old. And the story behind that donut is that it was made by a woman who was about to, you know, have, she was expecting, and she went into labor, and, and quite sadly, she died during childbirth. And her family ate the whole batch of donuts except for this one remaining donut. And nobody could bring themselves to either eat this donut or throw it out. So it was sort of stored in this cupboard in this family's home and it was passed on from generation to generation. And I actually have, you know, canned goods in my in my kitchen that um, my grandmother made that I just like can't bring myself to either open or throw out. Wow. There's there's also an interesting history of like materializations in seance rooms. Another uh, sort of interesting story. I can't exactly remember the source of it off the top of my head, but there was this medium uh, named Mrs. Guppy. And she would often materialize these elaborate ice sculptures in her seance sessions. And there are other accounts of, you know, beyond the usual ectoplasm and sort of materializations and effusions that of grossness and body fluids that happen in uh, sort of 19th century seance rooms. There was this sort of dematerializing food based practice almost. I think well, there's I've an seen... essay in there that I didn't get to write. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I was going to say, I've, I've seen those pictures floating around on social media of the the mcdonald's food that's like 30 years old it looks just yeah. like it did 30 <laughs> years ago that donut though man that that definitely takes the cake uh pun intended yeah maybe i should write a sequel like food specters and the object hereafter i think that would be a great idea yeah so you know one of the other things that is very fascinating and it's an idea that has come up uh, on the show before i think just one time but we talked about the taos hum in one of my very first episodes in the 10 or 15 or 20 range, I had a guest on who was talking about that. And come to find out, you're very familiar with that, but you're also very familiar with other hums from around the world, including one in your area where you live. And is yes. this something that, I mean, how common are these hums? You know, maybe we should tell people what they are too exactly, but how common are they? And what sort of effect do they have on the people in the area where they're at? Because not everybody seems to be able to hear them. Yeah, that's correct. So so hums are usually these sorts of uh, sonic rumblings or reverberations that usually occur within the infrasonic range. So slightly below or even further below the normal range of human hearing. And they they have occurred globally with pretty regular regularly um, since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. But there are also experiences that people have had with hum-like activity that we would describe as, as hums in today's language, but before heavy machinery existed. So sometimes hums are caused by industrial machinery. Sometimes they're caused by architecture in the landscape. Sometimes they're caused by animals and uh, natural landscapes too. And usually the way they manifest is the way that at least I've, I've experienced it locally with the, the Detroit Windsor hum or the Windsor hum as it's probably more popularly known is it sort of feels like your eardrums are reverberating, but you're actually not really hearing anything. And it kind of sounds, people have described it as uh, sounding like a Mack truck rumbling by or like a car is outside your house booming bass and you can feel that pressure on your eardrums and it's, it's very annoying and it ends up causing people who live in these communities near hum sites a lot of distress because, first of all, it can cause legitimate medical issues. It can cause migraines and insomnia, anxiety. But then if we start to move into um, the types of languages that, that your listeners are familiar with, it also can cause and mimic the effects of hauntings as well. It can make you feel very uneasy. And in some case, in really extreme cases, it can actually cause people to have sort of like mental health issues and, and sort of hallucinations and things like this. So 
when you say it out loud, it sounds like very much like rooted in conspiracy theory territory, which is why the hum is is kind of really intriguing and also worrying is because often people who experience this phenomena have to first prove that it's real and that they're experiencing it. So the Windsor hum is really fascinating because there is is an actual known cause to it. There have been scientific studies done. We have records of sound waves recorded. So we know that this is absolutely happening. This isn't all in people's heads. So where the Windsor Detroit hum is happening is there is this little industrial island that sits in the Detroit River between Windsor and Detroit. And it's owned by the the island is American and there's a U.S. steel plant on this island and there's a, um, a smelting plant on there. So it's like really heavy, nasty industrial landscape. There's like you can't go on the island unless you work on the island. It's kind of protected territory. And so because it's U.S. owned, there's no legal recourse for the Canadians across the river in Windsor, who are the people who are experiencing the effects of the hum the most. So it's this very complicated uh, sort of international hum that I don't know if there's another case <laughs> quite like this. Usually hum-like activity is, is rooted down into one community and, and there's sometimes there's a, a resolution for it, sometimes not. And in this case, it seems like it's not really ever going to go away. So is this similar then to the Taos hum and some of the other hums around the world? Yeah. Like, is it the yeah, same exactly. sort of sonic? Yeah, the Taos hum, okay. there's one in Bristol that's quite famous. There was an example of a, uh, a building that was built in Manchester. I think it's called Beatum Tower. And um, this it's a modern building and it was built in such a way that the wind reverberated off of it. And it, it almost sounded like um, like a scream. So it got <laughs> sort of nicknamed the screaming building. And um, apparently some of the sonic effects that were being caused by this building were uh, interfering with the filming of a Coronation Street episode. <laughs> so... In that case, I think they actually managed to put some sound dampening um, stuff on the outside of the building. But when it, it comes down to like these heavier industrial things where you have like processes of capitalism kind of rooted down, there's like deeper things to solve there. Yeah. And you mentioned the various conspiracy theories surround these hums and why they exist. What are some mm -hmm. of the more compelling ideas and theories <laughs> as to why these things exist to begin with? I, I actually I made a film, a short film, like a 25 minute film that goes along as a sort of accompaniment to the book. So whenever I've been doing these readings, I've been um, presenting you know, a bit about the book and then I'll screen this this film about the hum. And in the process of researching this film, I dug deep into um, places like YouTube comments, which are very deep and dark places, <laughs> depending on what For you're sure, researching. Yeah. And uh, so there is a there are a lot of sort of conspiracy theories out there where people think, you know, is are the hums caused by UFO activity? Are they caused by harp interventions? So there is a lot of it almost it becomes this thing where social media becomes a sort of social outlet and gathering place for people who suffer from the hum because it is such a, it's kind of like a frowned upon thing that, you know, it, again, it's like when you talk about it out loud, it, it sounds kind of wild and like a conspiracy theory in and of itself. And then there are things that are connected to the hum online too. Like you'll find videos on YouTube of like uh, trumpets in the sky and things like this. So there's a lot of very interesting sound-based presence on YouTube that is explored within the book as well. And the hum is sort of a grounding point for all of it. Well, if you had to put your money on one theory, what would it be? I think it's entirely scientifically explainable. I mean, the reverberations from the hum in Windsor are definitively, they've used microphones, these very uh, sensitive infrasonic range microphones to actually literally trace the, the hum activity back to this U.S. steel plant. But then there's this interesting language that gets mapped into the process of discovery about the hum. So in the case of the Windsor hum, the scientists who were researching this, actually, this is a direct quote, they said it was like chasing a ghost. So there's this very uh, sort of interesting use and misuse of language and the things that you can read into it. And I think the hums uh, around the globe, if you go online, there are these maps of the hums that are available. And eventually the pinpoints start to just crowd out the country. And every community, it's something different. It might just be the reverberations of wind across a, um, a mountainscape. It might be underground mining activity.
So I think in the case of the hum, it's one of those things that can cause you to feel like something deeper and darker and more mysterious is at play than than actually is. But there's no discounting the fact that it, it does cause people to feel, you know, in a in a very haunted sort of way. Yeah. And I guess what I'm really wondering is if you think that this is some sort of intentional, nefarious, you know, sort of mind control like <laughs> event <laughs> no. that's happening here. no i don't think so i mean i think it's like the the dark angle of of late capitalism haunting us maybe you know it's like oh, u.s yeah. steel you know in windsor detroit is definitely not going to stop producing steel because they're making us like a small segment of the population feel at you know ill at ease or something so often there isn't a solution to these things besides people moving out of the area i suppose which isn't always an option but yeah it's a complicated thing and it's a very it's an interesting thing in terms of, of sound-based media because it's also like invisible media. It's it's not something you can always directly hear or measure unless you have high-end, you know, scientific equipment or you're somebody who can actually physically experience this. Yeah, and you know, Kristen, I think one of the more fascinating components of your work, I mean, you're really deep into, uh, you know, this idea of the sonic specter and sound and frequency, but you have many ears disease and yeah <laughs> and that's i don't know for people who don't know what that is it's this very sort of i don't know odd hearing condition tell people what that is exactly and i guess how you i don't know it, it's just kind of funny you know it's like just one yeah. of those odd quirks like oh i'm really into sound but i also have this weird hearing condition so maybe you're tapping yeah. into something that we can't hear because you do have it i, I don't know <laughs> Yeah. So Meniere's disease is like this really funny, inner, it's not so funny, actually, it's really terrible inner ear disease. But it's I say it's funny, because it's it's funny for somebody who is a sonic researcher and a musician, and somebody who studies the history of anomalous sound in the world to have this very somewhat rare affliction. And I always describe it in this technological way, also. So the way it manifests with me, or the way it, it first started to manifest, is I would hear this really high, rising sort of uh, tinnitus tone, and it would get really, really high, and then it would kind of just like drop out, and there'd be like this whoop, kind of like, if you imagine like just dropping, you know, under an ocean or something. And then my ears get really uh, muddy for a few minutes afterwards, and at the same time, I get really dizzy. So it has this very strange effect that mimics a lot of the music I like to listen to. Like I like a lot of music with like harsh and deep bass to it. I'm also really interested in, you know, aquatic things. And it also has this sort of sense on a day to day for me of like having overly sensitive hearing. So while it's a degenerative hearing condition, it also makes my hearing amazingly sensitive. So if I go into like a noisy diner where there's a grill going. I always kind of describe my head as being like a mixing board with all the channels pushed up into the red, where I'm just as likely to hear an egg frying on the, the grill, you know, a couple like through the uh, grill window as I am the person across the table from me. So it's had a very uh, defining sort of relationship with, with my work. Um, I haven't always had it. I got diagnosed with it probably, I want to say like maybe 12 or 13 years ago, pretty early on when I moved to Detroit. And I didn't really know what was happening at first. I thought I just had like an ear infection or something like that. And that's actually how they think it, it might first manifest in people. But it's interesting when you start to look at the history of people who, who do have Meniere's disease and who are working in creative fields, it seems to afflict a decent amount of us. But yeah, it's had its moments. And then in the book, I talk about, in one chapter, the history of television piracy. And in particular, this Max Headroom Piracy Act that happened in the 1980s in Chicago, and likening that to the sorts of like late night television air checks and sound off tones and things like this. So there are things that I study, tones and ranges of tones that are very much aligned with how I experience Meniere's disease in the world. When I'm mixing music in terms of my, my sound output, electronic music output, I often have these sort of muddy bass tones and really high tones that kind of also mimic my hearing range. I, I did a series of talks in England around the launch of my book and embedded in one of those um, sort of audiovisual presentations, I 
I did. I, I got as close as I could to the tonal range of my own personal tinnitus and managed to actually trigger a Meniere's attack, which my friend Dave, who wrote the uh, intro to the book, always finds really amusing. He's, he says, I'm, I'm committed to my levels. So... <laughs> <laughs> The first afternoon when they entered the Elizabeth Street house, it was Kay, her mother, and her grandmother. Kay's mother had been given the key by her boyfriend the night before he left to return to his teaching job in northern Ontario. In Kay's memory, he never once came into that house while they lived there, and no one had been inside the house for at least five years. This is important to remember. The house was unnaturally unruly. The smell that poured over them when they stood in the entry foyer was not as offensive as it could have been. The air was stale with the subtle undertones of sickness. Past the foyer, straight ahead, they entered a living room. To the right was a bright red door. This was the first portal they were compelled to open, beckoned by its emergency hue. Behind the door was a closet containing the angled backside of the staircase. It was quite cavernous, the size of a small bedroom. Kay's mother pulled a cotton string to trigger the hanging bulb overhead. This room, compared to others, smelled fresh. The smell of sweet dough and eggs and butter wafted toward the trio. There were two card tables set up alongside one wall. Their tops were lined with baked goods. Nothing was moldy. Kay's mother reached out without pause and ran her finger through the frosting on a white cake, stopping short at bringing it to her lips. Everything was beautifully arranged. Artificial flowers surrounded platters of cookies and tiered cakes on polished silver risers. The cake's icing was fresh, like it had been spackled on earlier in the day. Kay's mother touched a pyramid of chocolate cookies and jumped back in shock, declaring they were warm to the touch. The prospect of eating all of these desserts excited the eight-year-old Kay, but her mother backed out of the room with a look of confused horror. She forced Kay and her grandmother to follow. Kay found this upsetting. What were they going to do about all of those treats? Throw them out, her mother said definitively. She was convinced that they were a trap, a test laid out by a vengeful spirit in waiting. There could be no other explanation for their freshness. The contents on both tables, pounds and pounds of hand-baked goods, were some of the first things that went into black trash bags and out onto the curb. They lived in the house for six months, but it felt much longer. Kay often wondered if the house would have acted more amicably if they had partaken in its offerings. I think I broke Skype. <laughs> yeah, what I happened think, there? That was. I, it's weird. Like I got this pop-up window that said my authentication had changed, and then it just booted me out. <laughs> oh, okay. The account you're using now is different than the one that you called me on earlier, so I have no oh, idea strange. what I have no idea what happened there. Regardless, I mean we're back. It was very curious timing though, because you had just finished reading it and then it just dropped out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> ah, super man. Strange. The Sonic Spectre, the object hereafter. Here we are. Technology haunted. What the hell's going haunted on? By both Google and Skype, apparently. Well, you know they're all in bed together, so whatever. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, Definitely. now now we got to figure out where the hell we are in this conversation. So let's transition into more anecdotes from the book, more of like the actual meat of the book. And one of the ideas in there that I really liked that ties into that phrase, the object hereafter, which we could maybe define. That's not too vague, but I think it does need some definition around it. But the object hereafter in stone tape theory, which is not something I had heard of prior to reading your book. I have heard of stoned ape theory, which is completely different. But, I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we could swap definitions here then. But uh, let's start with the stone tape theory. What is that? Because it is so fascinating and definitely, I don't know, it makes a lot of sense to me when you really lay it out. Yeah, so I think the first sort of accepted uh, instance of the use of, of stone tape theory is linked to uh, this book called Ghost and Ghoul. And it's from 1961 by an author named uh, Thomas Charles Lethbridge. And he was an archaeologist who was 
working pretty similarly to somebody like David E.H. Jones, who was interested in archaeoacoustics. It's kind of an extension of that idea. But Lethbridge was also studying to become a parapsychologist. And Lethbridge's ideas are more linked to architecture, stone architecture in particular. And we should be a little familiar with these ideas, like through um, some of the more modern ghost hunting shows. But like the idea that things like limestone and quartz in sort of stone based architecture have the ability to capture, say, historical traumas. So Lethbridge's ideas eventually get extended out into this really amazing, beautiful. And I I insist that everybody listening go and try and and find a copy of this. uh, Nigel Neal's Stone Tape. And uh, what that was, was a BBC Christmas ghost story that aired on primetime television in 1972. And in the stone tape, these characters attempt to sort of force a conversation from this haunted castle. And they end up bringing in a lot of crazy uh, computers and technology and tape machines and things like this to sort of ease out the screams of this dying woman. (laughs) So the stone tape is it's it's such a fascinating I mean, it's almost like this. This teleplay has defined stone tape and, you know, in these really it's people have heard of this theory, but they maybe haven't seen the stone tape. But it's definitely like a a sort of parallel theory that is present in a lot of modern psychic investigations. I don't know how familiar you are with, I guess, research into water. I know you mentioned Mm -hmm. earlier that you were into aquatic stuff. I'm not sure how deep into the water you are with this, but... (laughs) You know, as far as I have learned, I guess, water has memory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your body is made up of X amount of water, you know, 70% or whatever it is nowadays. But the more that I dug into what type of water the body is actually made up of, it's more of like a crystal type of thing. It's like a gel. It's like a crystalline type of gel, apparently. You know, I don't know for sure, Mm -hmm. obviously. But that's kind of what, you know, the more leading alternative research into this has shown to this point. But when you take it away from just pure liquid and you go into that crystalline structure, I mean, you're really getting into the stone and the rock stuff, which you just sort of alluded to there with, you know, the quartz and I guess any other sort of crystal that you could think of. Are we talking about the same thing then in in different ways now? Or is this, are these still two sort of separate things that we haven't really put together yet? The the rock and the water, the crystal and the the rock? I mean... It sounds to me like we probably are speaking the same language, which is just sort of this kind of gets to your question about the object hereafter, which is kind of like understanding geology as media and different scales of knowing things like down to a molecular level and finding ways to tease information out of that, whether it's, you know, something that's based out of a creative impulse or something that is purely scientific. So there, there is this whole fascinating branch of philosophy that, that I was really engaged with when I was more rooted in the academic world, which is, you know, kind of about engaging with non-human entities or the idea of deep time, or sometimes uh, you can find books under the idea of object-oriented ontology. And all of these things kind of mess with theories of, of you know, Earth as media, basically. And that's something that I, I definitely get into in the book in different ways and, and something that I'm always continuing to um, to expand on. Yeah, you wrote in the book, actually, that uh, you were most interested in exploring the boundaries between the trifecta of material, culture, sound, and belief, but that you value the voice of the object or the thing above all else and prefer to give space for its natural narratives to escape. I thought that was a pretty awesome statement there. And, you know, as I was reading through your book, I, I kind of came up with my own theory of maybe everything, you know, life, the universe, and everything here. <laughs> but All right. it just seems like that everything that is surrounding us is constantly recording us and playing back our own sort of sounds to us. I think that you could liken that to the idea of karma in Buddhism, you mm-hmm. know, like where you kind of reap what you sow, but you're just sort of like listening to the tape that you recorded you know, many years ago or whatever. I mean, it's just yeah. things are just constantly, I guess, picking up your vibrations and then just expressing them back to you. Does that make any yeah. sense to you? Yeah, I think it does. And I mean, I think it's it's something that's interesting to explore from a, a personal belief standpoint, but also from a, the total scientific angle of things, where if we start to think about 
you know, the moment of the Anthropocene, the moment where humans had a definitive impact on Earth. We can scientifically measure this through the presence of carbon and things like this. So it, there is some something to be said about, you know, we are impacting the Earth in, in ways, whether we realize it or not, and the Earth is recording how we are interacting with, with the Earth. I recently saw... I saw a few few interesting things in museums uh, recently. I went to see this really amazing show about uh, technology up at the V&A Museum in London. I think the title of the exhibit was The Future is Here or The Future is Now. Something about futures. Anyways, it was an amazing exhibit and I can't remember the title of it. But there was this embedded spike in a cube of like plexiglass or, or some kind of poured clear material and that spike was recorded representation of the exact moment where we began to have an impact on the earth through, you know, the industrial revolution and increased pollution and things like this. So these things are recordable and being recorded in some ways. And then another interesting thing I, I just saw in New York over the weekend was at this show about art and conspiracy at the Met Breuer. I'm not really that interested in conspiracy theories, despite, <laughs> you know, some of the things we've talked about in this, this yeah. podcast, but there are, there are a few, few moments. And um, I'd never heard of this guy before, this guy named Richard Sharp Shaver, who actually submitted a lot of science fiction stories to the pulp magazine Amazing Stories. And he believed there were these ancient beings who had this advanced technology and they lived in these subterranean caves and caverns. But he was submitting them as fiction, but he actually believed they were absolutely true. And then later in his life, he decided that by looking at these rocks, they these rocks were embedded with meaning from these ancient alien races and they were just sort of waiting to be decoded. And so he made paintings and uh, bound these little books called rock books. And he actually had a lending library where you could write to him and he would send you a, a slice of geode or some kind of mineral in the mail and tell you exactly what he thought was happening and waiting to be decoded in this, uh, this slice of rock. So really fascinating stuff that kind of blends worlds of, you know, belief, creative impulse and supernatural experience, I suppose. Yeah, that's wild, man. Do you have any hands-on experience with objects that may have had things recorded into them? Yeah. In the book, there's this chapter called Steak from a Mythical Lake. I think that's what I called it. But it's about this wooden prospector's stake that was planted into the ground at a place called Lake Edison, which is a misnomer. There was this lake, it was actually called Battle Lake in Wyoming, and supposedly it was supposed to be renamed Lake Edison, but it didn't happen. But the tag that is uh, attached to the stake in the museum where I work, it does say it's from Lake Edison. So it took a little bit of research to even figure out where the heck this stake was actually from, because it was like it had this misremembered story attached to it from the get-go. But if you look at this wooden prospector stake, it had been planted into the ground over many, many decades up at this lake in Wyoming. And the process of wind blowing sand against one side of the stake over this, this process or this you know, period of time basically turned the stake into a waveform pattern. So one of the things that I did when I was uh, creating sort of art projects and conceptual art projects based on things out of this book is I figured out a way to sonify the stake. So I actually um, scanned the stake and then I figured out um, there's this great program called Audio Paint. It's very bare bones, but what it allows you to do is sonify images. And it doesn't exactly make pretty sound, but there's a few different ways that I use this idea of like teased out sound from things like these stakes, or there's another whole project I did around dirt that we can talk about. And the sound that you get out of that process initially is usually just like very staticky and, and glitchy, unpleasant sounding stuff. And then I tend to take that as a starting point and sort of try to, you know, figure out what the voice of the object is and use things like analog synthesizers and digital audio workspaces like like Ableton Live and uh, sort of stretch and manipulate the sounds into something that sounds a little bit more pleasing and, and ambient to our human ears. Yeah, I was experimenting with that in a digital way just a few weeks ago, just for fun, because I, I don't know how I stumbled across it, but I was dropping JPEGs into my <laughs> audio software as raw data. And mm -hmm. 
there's a sound encoded into there somehow. It's just a really sort of sharp static sound. I was trying to experiment with it for a podcast here, and I didn't do anything with it, but I thought it was an interesting idea. This is before I picked up your book and started reading through it and like realized that, oh, fuck digital media. I could do this with <laughs> rocks and pieces of wood and uh, yeah. dirt, as you said, which was my next question, actually, was to tell us a little bit about your experiments with sonifying dirt. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah, it, it becomes very addictive. So, so, you know, as like, you know, in this blended role that I have as museum curator, where I'm entrusted with like 19th century prospector stakes, there's also this sort of collector impulse that continues in my own personal life. And I think I mentioned this, I, I did a folklore degree at one point in my life at the University of Oregon. And around that time, I was working in a in an archive, the Mills Archives, and um, they have really amazing stuff like there's a pretty large collection of Bigfoot folklore in there, if there's any Bigfoot researchers out there, but also a lot of student projects through the history of the, the folklore program there, which has been around at least since the 60s, I think. So around that time, I was working very much on the sort of complementary end of paranormal cultures where I was investigating the, the visual aspects of that, and especially like architecture and paranormal culture. So uh, at that time, I started to visit a lot of these sites of purported hauntings. And I would often, you know, sort of dig up a little baggies worth of dirt and take it with me, not really fully knowing what I was going to do with that stuff. But I had this very strong impulse that this is something that I needed to do. So at that time, I was doing a lot of research around the sort of multidisciplinary hauntings of the poltergeist. You know, the poltergeist is something that enacts itself on architecture, but then also on people and objects. And it does have this sort of sound manifestation angle. And it is a very sort of material based haunting. So this archive of dirt samples from poltergeist sites began to grow and grow and grow. And um, a few years ago, I started to get into the world of analog synthesizers. And there's a gentleman named Martin House, and he developed this special custom analog synthesizer filter that had the ability to sonify dirt. So the, the module itself is shaped like a little coffin, which is really uh, kind of charming. But then he was filling them with uh, samples taken from something relevant to vampire media, I believe. They were like vampire earth modules. But I talked to him and told him about my project, and he agreed to ship one to me empty so that I could fill it with my own dirt samples. So I think the most interesting thing that probably came out of that project is I spent a little bit of time down in Miami with my friend Dave, who wrote the intro to the book, and we were doing this event around car audio bass battles while we were there, um, which is totally disconnected. <laughs> um, but I did know that in Miami, there was this famous poltergeist case uh, at a, the site of an old warehouse called Tropication Arts. And so I, I sort of convinced Dave to go with me to visit this former site. And we like dug some dirt out of the sidewalk cracks. And then I noticed that there was a botanica just a few doors down and they were selling uh, magnetite in there, which is often used as a um, sort of material of attraction in folk uh, sort of spells and things like this. And so um, I combined the dirt with the magnetite and something in the process of that created if you know anything about Miami's music scene and the Miami bass music scene specifically is that, well, it's very bassy. And I think the dirt sample from Miami turned out to be the most bassy sample. And it's it's probably just something in the makeup of the soil, but it's also somehow like just amazingly and wholly appropriate. And often, again, it sort of just sounds like static and glitches. But then I have other modules in my analog synthesizer that can sort of freeze and smear time and create these very sort of beautiful, lush um, soundscapes out of this, this soil. So not to ramble on too much longer, but it, it's kind of like, I love this idea of technologies being used as mediators to unlock these kinds of minor scales and, you know, taking that data as a kind of conceptual starting point and um, just sort of being open and willing to listen to these embedded kind of molecular compositions, for lack of a better word. Yeah, that's pretty sexy, to be honest, when you lay it out like that. But, <laughs> yeah, the you know, dirt synth is like, yeah, it's kind of become known as the dirt synth. And I really want to take the dirt synth out into the world. But um, I always worry about TSA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I Well, I mean, for other reasons, too. But I don't know how much you know about magic and witchcraft. But this kind of reminds me of 
you know, how people will take objects or things like dirt and use them in their spells as a way to, like, connect to certain energies or certain people. I don't know if we're talking about the same thing, but it seems like that that might be why they do that, because those objects or that dirt or whatever they're using are embedded with that that sort of sonic memory of where they were and who they've been around, and that that might make the working more effective. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and and that's actually exactly the same idea of something like the stone tape theory or archaeoacoustics. It all kind of gets back to this residual media and the residuals of place, you know, whether it's upon dirt or architecture or objects or food in your refrigerator. (laughs) So, But dirt does have like a very strong sort of presence in witchcraft and in the history of magic and even uh, American folk magic and things like this. So um, if you look into the history of um, botanicas and root work, things like this, I'm no I'm no expert, but just because of the nature of my research and and going through a folklore degree, um, it's a very sort of visual culture. So you, you come up against it. And there's this really beautiful book that to give my publisher a strange attractor a plug just released about the museum of of witchcraft and it's sort of also about these residual objects you know it's not dirt but it's it's about the residual memory of objects that were used in these rituals and you know you might look at this thing and it's like well it's just a pin but is it really just a pin actually it was a pin that was used to basically torture women who were believed to be witches and to try to figure out if they were witches or not so I think objects, this is getting to the idea of the, the object hereafter, you know, objects have these these voices, and I'm all about trying to find ways to listen to them. Definitely. And before we get too far away from it, the stoned ape theory, which yeah, I, what is that? I hadn't heard of, <laughs> that is the, uh, it's a theory put forth by, I believe Terrence McKenna, he put forth this theory that, I guess, what you would call um, human evolution, like advanced human evolution, came from magic mushrooms, from ingesting magic mushrooms. So uh, pretty controversial in, you know, I guess, academia, but it is, I don't know, It's I guess it's a thought-provoking <laughs> theory, but I don't, I don't know how much gravitas I would give it. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, that's one thing when I say, you know, we started off this interview and I talked about, you know, oh, I'm kind of like when I was in the process of writing this book and agreeing to release it out into the world, I became really nervous about having these stories of my own sort of upbringing. And some of those are are more real than you would think they are. Some of them are these amalgams of misremembered things that are sort of like these collapsed generational stories that have become true over time through the process of family folklore. But I think through folklore studies, just in terms of of like an academic degree, that was a really interesting place to be in because it was a little bit different than, than anthropology in some ways because it allowed you to sort of, you know, however far flung your beliefs might be, it kind of made space for those things. And... Yeah, I mean, it's it was like very interdisciplinary, but also like really respected porous belief. And I think I'm personally not a huge, you know, McKenna fan, but all the power to the people that are totally into McKenna out there, you know, there's probably some degree of truth in something he has to say. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't just dismiss everything that he says. Exactly. There's always something there for sure. Well, let's sum up where people can find your book, High Static Deadlines, if they're interested, and where they can keep up with the rest of your work. So uh, High Static Deadlines, as of right now, it looks like uh, copies will be, if you go to your, your typical online big retailer like Amazon and order a copy for the U.S. there, those will be shipping out in early December, I believe. If you decide you absolutely can't wait that long, you could go directly to uh, Strange Attractor's website and you can order a copy from there. So yeah, either Strange Attractor or any of your favorite uh, online retailers. I'm not sure who's going to be carrying the book physically just yet in in the States at the very least. So yeah, that's that's probably a good place to start. And I'm on all the usual social media platforms as well if you want to keep up with things there. Absolutely. We will link all of that in the show notes for sure. So, Kristen Gallerno, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed the chat. Yeah, thanks so much. And there you have it. My thanks again to Dr. Kristen Gallerno. Thought that was a hell of a fun chat. Sonic Spectres, Audio Anomalies, Earth as Media, and The Object Hereafter. Fucking A.
That Earth is Media thing is the idea that resonated with me the most during the chat. I shared that very basic level epiphany I had about how essentially the environment around us is constantly recording our energy and vibrations and throughout time has expressed it back to us. I think there's something to that. And I know I'm not the first person to think of something like that, probably, but I don't hear that talked about much. Or maybe I'm not listening to the right conversations. And speaking of listening to conversations, I think you can also make a great case that all this modern surveillance technology, the smartphone in your hand, the Alexa device on your countertop, the cameras in the street lights, I think you can look at that as just mimicry of your natural environment. I have always, always, always resonated with the idea that the computer was modeled after the functionality of the human brain, that the internet was modeled after the invisible energetic pathways that connect us all. And I think this conversation here makes the ultimate trifecta, the unholy trinity that is man-made technology. Every device recording your everything is just modeled after something natural. Rocks, trees, whatever. I mean, aren't crystals used in most of this tech anyway? And maybe all this technology isn't a product of some reverse engineering post-Roswell. Maybe it's simply a product of a fundamental understanding of how nature works, how the human being works, how you and I work. I mean, if someone or some group out there wants to create a society based on artificial intelligence, it stands to reason they're modeling the AI after, I mean, let's call it NI, natural intelligence, which has been the one constant of our environment across all chapters of the human story. NI also, coincidentally, the chemical symbol for nickel, which actually stabilizes the structure of your RNA and is found in every single cell in your body. Natural intelligence embedded into you and everything living around you and all the shit we use to stimulate us these days is just a copy of something in your lawn or your garden right now. Some real brain food here. Take it for what it's worth. And more brain food in the Patreon extension. We jammed for another 45 minutes riffing on topics such as tree telephony and the internet of trees. Charles Francis Jenkins' work on marine fax machines and listening to Mars. Hacking TV stations and broadcast possession. ARPANET, Bridging Dimensions, Witchcraft and Coding, Legend Tripping and Local Folklore, Imprinted Trauma and Memory on Objects and Physical Places, Loving the Trauma of Horror Films and some of Kristen's favorite horror films, and George Tyrell's Theory of Apparitions and the quote, When I think a haunting, I make a haunting. Good stuff. And a shout out to new patrons, Jeff, Katen, and Oliver, and a huge thank you to Blake who became the newest official executive producer of the show. You guys keep this show on the air, and I am extremely grateful for the support. It gets harder and harder to keep doing this. And if you want to join these fine folks and help me continue to march toward my goal of making this show even better, patreon.com slash occulture shall be your destination. It would be a nice holiday treat for yourself and for me, of course, not going to lie. So take a few days or a week and give that one a think. I'm going to go do some thinking of my own. So until next time. You've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh, 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 oh.